Hello, everyone. It's very good to make group. Right? So we're going to definitely take questions. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we're really excited to be here. And Lisa, I'm excited to join us. And today, we're going to talk about how grocery purchase behavior can give very close signals around your behavior in general, outside of just what you eat. And in the 1800s, there was a French statement, statement that said, tell me what you eat and I'll tell you what you are. That term later turned into, you are what you eat. And today we're going to talk about those signals of what you buy at the grocery store. And I'm sure all of you can think about what you buy generally and what's in your own grocery cart. And maybe it's some Red Bull right now, and there's some coffee I see you all drinking. Um, but a lot of times we're going to be able to see those signals that you have during your lifestyle and how grocery can predict those behaviors. Uh, so I'm very happy to be with Lisa, who has over 25 years of experience in the media industry. Uh, of course, she's now the client portfolio president at Mindshare, but prior to that, she was at Epsilon and on the console. Lisa, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And um, you guys didn't have any turkey for lunch, did you? <laughs> uh, no trip to painting. Sort of, that's what you call it. Um, and I said, this is like church. Nobody wants to be in the front row. So um, you are a small but many group, and we appreciate you. Um, you appreciate you hanging out with us for the next 20 minutes or so. So I think you can take a look at the first question. All right, so obviously this topic at CES, there's been a lot of discussion around first-party data. The deprecation of the cookie is starting to happen, and so advertisers have been and are rapidly figuring out alternative solutions, which is why first-party data has been incredibly popular. Lisa, my question for you is on my chair, as you think about the value and the quality of these audiences, how do you approach a scorecard for how you assess different first-party data? Well, it's kind of funny. I was having a chit chat with someone in the audience, and I'm going to audible here a little bit. Um, so I think there's a lot of buzzwords here in uh, in this thing. I, I don't know that I'm going to say AI, and you can give me those cards out. But another thing is first-party data, and then I think addressable audiences. And I'm going to talk about first-party data and addressable. You know, at the end of the day, first-party is your data, and that can be everything from an email address to a phone number for a text to somebody who gives you all, you know, their, their name, their you know, phone number, their, um, their, their, you know, uh, credit card information. Um, obviously, that's all PII. But if you look at addressable audiences, there's kind of an arc on that. And there's first party, and then there's kind of addressable, and then what we're all used to kind of marketing to, um, demo, age, you know, all those other things. So I think it's really important to think there's a spectrum here, and just because you might not have a lot of first party data, or you don't have a strong first party data strategy, that doesn't mean that you can't have an addressable strategy. And I think folks like Kroger, can help us with that, even outside of the grocery space. So the rubric I use, um, and, and my chair uses, and, and I think a lot of planners and marketers could use is first, is the data have recency? And what I mean by recency, if we have any data scientists uh, in the audience, is recency is a predictor of what you're going to do next. And what's great about you know um, grocery data is pretty recent, and you're voting with your wallet every day or every week. Second is, does the audience have scale? And it's great to know a lot of things about people, but if you can't really do anything with it, and scale means different things to different marketers or different partners. The third thing that I really like about this space, it's transactional. You vote with your wallet. Much like food is, is kind of a signal of who you are, you both vote with your wallet. You're, you're not spending money on things that aren't important to you, and they start to paint a picture of what you're interested in. And then I think a, a fourth one is, is the data longitudinal. Because you can do something, you know, a couple days, but if it's not kind of a habit, then really should you should you give attribution to this purchase of, of granola bars if you just did it once, or, you know, um, organic fruits and vegetables because you decided to be a vegan for a week, like my daughter. Um, and we have a lot of, you know, vegan type things in the house. Um, so I would say longitudinal, transactional, it has scale and recency. And I would look at any audience in the addressable world with that lens and give yourself kind of that scorecard. I love that. I think with retail media data in particular, as 20, 30, 40, 50 new players enter the market as of last year, 
as you score them, it's important to really ass assess what is the distinct difference between all of these data sets. With Kroger, there's a loyalty card that's been around for 20 plus years, and so there's a, a nice value exchange. When you swipe that card, you're going to get instant savings, you're going to get fuel points, and that value equation is what can keep this loyalty card program going on. There's other retailers that use credit card data or are having to model certain data sets, so it's just important to ask this question. What does this first party data set, what's the makeup of it, and how do you collect that data? What does that value exchange look like? And I think from there, you'll be able to understand the quality of that data set. Absolutely. All right, so my next question is, with the third party cookies going away, everyone really is thinking or rethinking their data strategy. What should be a brand's mindset during this time of data disruption? I, I kind of led into this before. It's I first kind of think like, where are you on this arc? Are you one of these kind of planners, and you, you've been, you know, we're, we've been going at this for a while, and you know, we've really got a strong strategy. I, I had a, a beauty client, and you know, um, they've got 40 million people in their loyalty file, a strong app program, a lot of people log in, they've got buy online, pick up in store, so like. They're feeling pretty good. I mean, no one's feeling like totally secure. And then you have CPG on the other side, you know, don't get a lot of first party data, you know, and, and you know, they're trying to do sweepstakes, they got email, and then you have kind of everybody in, in between. So first I would say, where are you there? And then I would say, I think it's an and, not an or. Just because you feel good about your first party data strategy doesn't mean you should start looking for those quality addressable audiences in all <coughs> the places they exist. And one of the things I was thinking about is if Kroger, or name whatever partner you want to, popped up tomorrow, and you never knew they were a grocery store, you never knew what they were, and they just said to you, wow, I've got this transactional data, and I get it like every day, every night, and it's quality assured, and I, I see it over time, years and years, or months and months, and I can do close reporting in certain categories. You would take a meeting with these people in two minutes, and you would be like, wow, this is so good that I can use this data um, that is addressable, and I don't know that you'd be hung up that it was collected in a grocery store. So I would say be open-minded to the partners that you're talking to, and think about what is the value of the data, not necessarily like where it came from, you know, if you're a financial service company or you're a retailer, and get hung up on, well, that's only for e-commerce, and that's only for CPG, and if it's not endemic, it's not really, you need, you're not sold in that outlet, it's really not, you know, important to me. I, I, I would have a little bit of a test and learn strategy. You know, you have 80% of your spend at VAU, and then I would have 20% to experiment, you know? I think it's a time that, you know, you know, you should start thinking about um, those types of things. It's a, oh, don't judge a book by its cover. Yes, don't talk, don't judge a book by its cover. So on that note, as you think about Kroger being a great solution for CPG brands, tell me what other verticals you would consider when you think about don't judge a book by its cover that you might think would be good for leveraging this powerful data set. So in my chair, I work on the Discover business, but I also work on Tyson, Abbott, and it's kind of, it's kind of a, a regular or totally if you don't, you don't know those brands. And, um, you know, I was being asked by the Discover client the other day, and I, I think there's this idea of, okay, think about it. Most people use a credit card to buy groceries. And, you know, you want that, you know, credit card to be top of the wallet. You guys don't have a private little credit card. And so I think that there's this idea, you know, if you just think someone who um, needs a credit card is this type of person, you know, whatever. If you're not going to use a bureau ping, and I'm getting into little, um, you know, sausage making, a bureau ping that you just want to address whole audiences, that's a very indicative of, of is the person credit worthy? They charge a lot of groceries. Is the person, you know, what's their size of basket, the frequency of purchase, how long have they been a loyalty member? That could be a very good indicator for a financial services client as to where to find a very high volume purchaser using their card in a category that's very meaningful to you and um, that indicates that they're credit worthy, you know, you, you know, without dealing with some of the compliance issues. You know, you're not doing a firm offer of credit. But then I was imagining, like, okay, that's my world, but like, what if you're, um, and this was a real case study of mine, this was a, a lingerie brand, and they you know, were launching all these, you know, things in that particular category, but they were moving into yoga pants, and their 
question was to me, well, great, we can't use our first party data because none of these people really bought this category. So where do we find, you know, where they buy the category? Well, we're not going to conquest like Lululemon. So we said, let's find indices of where we think we'll predict that someone is a yogi. Well, I started to think about the grocery store, right? You're buying um, meditative tea. You're buying certain types of, um, uh, uh, call it uh, granola bars, you're buying clean food, you're doing things that would suggest, maybe it's candles. There's a wide uh, variety, a variety of purchase fee things that can be layered and attributed to create what I'm going to call an RFF score against yogis. So that might have been a perfect um, example of us going and saying, let's use Kroger for that. So I, after we're done talking, I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. And by the way, if you want to jump in now, by all means jump in now, because you know it's kind of no fun talking at people. You know, audience participation is always welcome. So if anybody has any other ideas, okay, I love it. I love it. Why not? Oh, thank you. <laughs> so having been in the industry for a while, so your idea of how to use data on a retail side for not in yes, or to retail for five years, same idea, as Jill, like all the great work you've done. How much, I, when I would work with agencies, though, they seem pretty hesitant to go outside of what is the tried and true practice. Absolutely. So people buy beverages, I know who buy soda, I'm going to go out and go to So I like what you're saying, that we see more of that in practice, to understand the test and learn of, oh, I created this audience segment using this model. It either worked out phenomenally or it didn't. Either way, it's okay. I think it's an industry we can do more test and learning and actually pull it off now. But one of your perspectives, one who oversees, so one of the things I'll say is um, working um, in the agency world and, and at Epsilon with a lot of direct client relationships and, um, and now at Mindshare. And Mindshare's got a phenomenal commerce business. And our clients are asking us, but don't think of commerce data as just, they're challenging us, don't think of commerce data as just commerce data. So Lisa, you run a large portfolio that's not just all CPG. So we should be absolutely, at Mindshare and other places, pushing the boundaries and be first mover on that because we've been in commerce for so long, but we shouldn't be stuck in this rut. But I would also say on the client side, I think that you have to give your partners permission to test and I wouldn't say fail, but learn. And learning something that, you know, maybe, um, you didn't think the outcome was, doesn't mean that you failed. So sometimes I use this analogy, and agencies are afraid to burn the toast. And so, like, you know what I mean? If you're not really engaging your partners with permission, and then also having a strong learning agenda of what you want to learn, that doesn't mean pass or fail. It means learn. And then if you learn that certain endemic or non-endemic data works. It doesn't mean all endemic and all non-endemic work. It's maybe the audience you selected and what your KPI was. Maybe the KPI wasn't right. Maybe you were thinking it would be performance-based when it, it, sh it should have been consideration and awareness or vice versa. So I wouldn't get hung up in a channel and I wouldn't get hung up in where the data comes from and I would say don't have the burn of the toast mentality. I think that question is very spot on because it's what most of us are feeling. I think the deprecation of it, if you can help with that and help transform some of these traditional practices that have been around for 20 plus years. And I think with agencies, our role is to help them try to surprise their clients and think about something great through and different. And who would put maybe a Kroger and a Taco Bell together? You might not think it's an organic match, but you better believe Kroger can tell you every burrito enthusiast that's across America is uh, enjoying Taco Tuesday. So there's a really unique, and you um, mentioned the lingerie client, again, surprising relationships, but when you bring the data sets together, there's some really cool activation. I think tension is good. Tension in marketing is good. I think we all got into this to be creative. I mean, I've become a bit of a gearhead, but you know what I mean, in MarTech and AdTech, but I just think like right now, now is the time to be creative and, and, and to experiment, and, and, and that brings the fun to the business. And I think that's where the, the next big idea comes from. Because if no one's willing to do that, where does the next big idea come from? Do we have time for another question? Yeah. Um, are there like certain data points or identifiers that you're starting to lean more into or that you're 
thinking you're going to kind of help with the addressability issues as we kind of like, as like the third party cookie finally gets deprecated, like that you're focusing on and you think is a little bit more efficient or able to inform, I guess, like what's going on in a more like holistic way across the ecosystem? Like, are there any specific ones that you think are going to kind of stand out in this whole world? You know, I wish I could say there's a silver bullet and there's ones that are going to stand out, but I think so much could be um, relevant to your category and also how much first party data you have. And I'll, again, I'll just use Discover as an example. We just have a lot of compliance issues. And so we, we, we can't use a lot of data that we would love to be using, right? You know, zip, you know, ethnicity, blah, 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 blah. So I think you have to kind of figure out what's most important. And I go back to the comment here. If you have a rubric and you say lifestyle or um, or this idea of geolocation or if um, if something is related to it being transactional, I know they need to pull out their, their card for this given your business. You know what what would be most indicative of what would benefit me? And I think sometimes that's where the creativity comes from, where you sit with your data scientists and you look at what's happening, you know, kind of in your own world and you try to find proxies for that. And if you gave me a specific example, I might be doing a little bit better, but I, I just wish I could say, oh my gosh, if you do this, then you're going to get around the third party, or you're going to get around the deprecation, or these are now going to be the indicators. But I, I think I would be foolish to say that, that um, for retail and kind of coal, it's going to be the same as Discover Home Loans. I mean, it's just, it's just not. So, um, does that answer your question? Or is that kind of like, uh, did I cop out? <laughs> You know, there was one client I had again that this is a home decor brand, but what's really interesting is they were like, we know who all these home decor enthusiasts are. And I said, well, you know that because you know what they're doing at your house. And one of the things we were looking at, and again, this is another thing where grocery data can be great, home entertaining is a hot category. Cocktails are a hot category. CB2 and Crate and Barrel sell a lot of glassware and entertainment wear. What better way to look at the grocery store and see what they're buying and how much they're buying and even the day of the week they're buying it? Are they buying it on Thursday? Are they getting ready? That's a data indicator if I'm Crate and Barrel, I'm not going to anymore, but I might bring them up. That is an indicator that goes, wow, that person is a home entertainer. They might be buying couches from you, but not buying glassware from you, but Grover can tell you that they should be buying glassware from you. It makes me think of our baking enthusiast audience, which is people who love flour and are buying that pretty frequently throughout their month, and Cuisinart or something like that could be really interesting. So um, I love that green barrel example. Um, as we wrap, in about like 30 seconds or less, Lisa, you want to share sort of three takeaways for everyone as they hop their flights this evening back home, what they should take away from this conversation. Put some fun back in marketing. Experimentation is going to be critical. Don't worry about burning the toast. And if you have a partner that's not bringing you what you want, be honest, be direct, and and and, and lock arms and say, we're, we're, this is clay, we're going to create together. I think always lead with your North Star. And really, what am I trying to get out of this? I think a lot of people go into testimony plans with horrible, horrible blueprints, and they don't do the work, and it's very shiny object focused. Oh, we're over here, we're over there. And, and third, I would also say, how am I gonna measure what I learned, not if it was successful? And I think you need to, again, look at some key KPIs that are important to your organization and try to get the learning against those, but it's not pass-fail, it's what I, what I learned. And then also, like, as your sponsors, you know, um, you know, give the budget for these things, be very clear and set expectations. Like, I think a lot of times we don't do a good job setting expectations and, and really managing, and I think that that puts fear in people. But if you say this is what I'm setting out to do, it, it might be a first base hit, not a home run. I think um, everybody wants to look good and shine in their jobs, so I think managing up is a, is a tough fourth that I'll just, uh, I'll just give. Yeah, I love it. But I think look good is by giving surprising or big ideas, making uh, the other one I would add is how do we as an industry eliminate waste to add impressions and use that retail data and make sure when you're serving a pet or a dog food commercial or impression, it's not going to a family that has no pets in the household. Uh, we need a, a responsibility to eliminate ads, the carbon emissions from ad, ad waste. And so um, that's, I would say, another takeaway from today. 
but Lisa, thank you for thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.